Hello and welcome to the Natham conference session on the accountability and court performance core competency. We had hoped to be able to be presenting this to you face to face in New Orleans, but we're happy to have the opportunity to do it this way. My name is Diane Robinson. I'm a senior court research associate with the National Center for State Courts, and I'm happy to be here today with Jonathan Williams, who's the court administrator from the Massachusetts Trial Court. John? Thank you, Diane. So the learning objectives for today's session are to ensure that by the end, you can describe this core competency of accountability and court performance. You can understand the role that data governance plays in it. You can describe at least three aspects of data governance. And finally, identify your court's next step in developing or implementing data governance plan. So let's talk about uh, this core competency. Now, the core competency model has uh, 13 different components, and accountability and court performance clearly connects with a couple of the other competencies like case flow and workflow and operations management. But what they really do is they flow up into some of those uh, higher uh, order competencies like court wide governance, strategic planning, public relations, and maybe most important, public trust and confidence in the court system. It's one thing to think that your court is performing at its best, but it's a completely different thing to know that it's performing at its best. And we have to be accountable to the judiciary, to the public, to demonstrate uh, what we're doing by measuring and managing our performance. Collecting and analyzing performance information ensures that we can deliver on that promise. There are many resources available to you found on the National Center for State Courts website. Time standards for handling court cases were first adopted in the 1980s. The court tools uh, set of measures was adopted in the 2000s. The high performance court framework was adopted in 2010, and the principles for judicial administration were adopted in 2012. And all of these things help us move from performance measurement to performance man management. So when we break it down, Accountability in court performance is about organizing, collecting, analyzing, and systematizing our data, and that supports the analytical function. Then applying the knowledge that we gain to improve our actual court performance, that's the management part, and then sharing this information about performance with the various stakeholders, whether that's uh, the people making decisions about allocating our resources or the public in wanting to know how their matters are being resolved and being resolved uh, for uh, everyone who depends on the court system. Diane? Data governance is the key to using data to improve court performance, moving from just measurement to actual management and, and paying attention to court performance. Sometimes, like in this Dilbert cartoon, we find we only have bad data. And how many of you have been in meetings like I have where if the data agrees with the goal, then they go for it. They call it good data. That, in fact, of course, is, is not good data. Um, and in fact, bad data can often do us more harm. When bad data were you know, in case files and boxes in the basement of the courthouse, nobody cared or even really knew that, there were, that bad data was hidden there. It did not have the same impact that it does today with the, with the ready availability of court data. And again, you know, using incomplete or wrong data is often worse than not using data at all, because it can really lead us down the wrong path if the data are telling us something that, that in fact is, is not true. So how do we avoid having bad data? How do we have data that's usable that helps us actually improve court performance? Well, that's by having good data governance. And data governance is the framework by which we make decisions about how how we use data, how we collect data, how long we keep data, um, all of the decisions around data. Data governance is also how we make sure that our business activities and data management are synchronized so that it, it's a proverbial tail wagging the dog. The business the activities are why the courts exist. The data have to support that and support the needs of the court users. And finally, to develop and, and document strategies around the collection, use, and disposal of data so that we have plans for that, so that they're in compliance with our court rules and with our, and with our state laws. So I have a question for you. If we were all in the same room today, I would be 
doing this as a poll, but I will just ask you as a question instead. Do you have a data governance policy? Some of you are probably on one end of the spectrum where, yes, you have a data governance policy. It's pretty complete, and you're here today because you want to learn, learn more about data governance. Some of you may be at the other end of that spectrum where you're just asking, what exactly is data governance again? Most of you, I'm guessing, are probably somewhere in the middle where you have pieces of a data, of a data governance policy. I find that many courts frequently have a, have a written policy for how they share data, um, but may not have uh, may not have policies, formal written policies for how data are used internally, um, or may not have policies around the, the uh, collection of data or use of data um, or around definitions. Or some of you are probably in the, in the place where we've kind of talked about it. We know we need to have a data governance policy. We've kind of talked about it. We haven't really gotten started yet. So let's start with some principles of data governance. The first is to treat data as a, as a to treat court data as a strategic asset, recognizing how incredibly important data, um, having good data is to our, to our short and long-term goals, to the managing of the courts, um, to, to keeping track of, of court performance measures that, that are important for our courts. So firstly, treating it as a strategic asset. The next principle is to make sure that, that you have data quality as a central part of your day-to-day -day business and of your strategic plan. The data quality has to be a top priority for the court and, and everyone has to take responsibility for that on a day-to-day -day basis. You also need to identify the key personnel. So who has responsibility for data governance? Who makes the final call when there are disputes about data? Um, and who is, who is responsible for monitoring data quality and making sure that court data are of good quality? Also having practical data standards in place. And by practical, this means that they are realistic. Again, that this links back to being consistent with your business process, um, that those data standards are relevant to, relevant to your users. You need to have a plan and consistent strategy to identify and solve data problems because they will come up um, consistently. And so you need to have a way to address it when data problems do come up. Sometimes those are quite urgent. Um, it's a matter of what a, a judge is looking at on the bench. Others are, are longer term issues that still need to be addressed. You also need to make innovation and learning part of court culture. And that includes knowing what data are available and how to use the data. When someone is curious about or needs to know something that's happened in the court, I will tell you, when I hear someone say, well, I'll go back through the files, that makes me a little crazy because it's, it's inefficient. It's not a good use of our staff time. If there are things that you need to know, you should be able to pull them out of your case management system or, or data warehouse. Um, but knowing what data are available and how to use it is really important for all court users. There also needs to be a mechanism to resolve conflicts among stakeholders, because sometimes people want data for different purposes or need it for different things. A judge may use a data field in one way, but maybe the clerk um, is looking at it a different way. So there has to be, there has to be a way to identify and, and to resolve those sorts of conflicts. So for data to be a strategic asset, it has to be accessible, it has to be accurate, and it has to be standardized. This is all part of data governance. So we're going to start about talk, start talking about the accessibility of data. Now I've been around long enough to uh, to see these file folders, John, and I think you have too. Too. So, um, in fact, my first job anywhere around the legal system was when I was a senior in high school. I was a runner for a law firm. And I got to go all around the courthouse and meet everybody in every uh, corner of the clerk's office. And there were shelves and shelves and shelves of files. And that was the only place to find the answer to the questions. It was in those files. Um, I learned later when I came into court administration that uh, all through the 60s, the 70s, and on into the 80s, each individual court would fill out little tables of how many cases have been filed, how many cases have been disposed. Um, and they would stick them in first in envelopes in first class mail and mail them to the administrative office of the courts where they could all be tabulated and probably sorted on punch cards uh, with the first computer systems. And that was data analysis for its day. 
So I certainly remember all this. And of course, we all know these files. These files surround us every day, but more and more we have moved into an electronic age. So much of the information that used to sit only inside these manila folders is now in uh, electronic databases where we can uh, access it uh, more quickly and make more sense of it. When it was all inside these files, it was hard to verify anything was true. It was certainly hard to track anything. And as we've discussed, it was certainly hard to analyze anything. If you were talking about how to manage a court, you needed to have someone around who was either very experienced, and very wise to know the ebb and flow of court business, or you relied on blind faith that someone's best guess was probably close to the truth. So today, changes in court data um, have come about because we capture so much more electronically. Whether it's just in a giant database that serves as an index to court activities and details of uh, what's happening in various files, or if it's a fully functional case management system that actually schedules matters, handles notice to parties, uh, builds court calendars, and serves many other functions, we have come many, many, many miles uh, toward uh, the digital age. And of course, the next place where we're all going is uh, fully digital files where the images of every filing are available electronically and are built into a robust case management system. And this makes available to us all kinds of useful court data about the way our courts are uh, performing. So not only is this information available to us uh, numerically, but we have great tools now for data visualization. Once upon a time, we had Excel and you could generate graphs uh, and, and do things that way, but that could be cumbersome. Now with business intelligence tools, you can take large sets of raw data probe into it across all kinds of filters and generate uh, uh, really educational uh, visualizations of uh, data as well. Let's take a simple example from the court tools framework. Clearance rate. Clearance rate is a great and simple metric. It's basically, the, and, and most people in the room know this, it's cases disposed divided by the number of cases filed during a period of time. So this example that's up on the screen right now of clearance rates uh, would be for a court divided into six divisions. And the person running the clearance rate data here has uh, ranked them in order of the highest clearance rate to the lowest. Um, you can see that that sort of cream colored bar, um, third down from the top, uh, rests at right about 100%. So in that division, during this period of time, the same number of new cases were filed as were disposed of. So what jumps out at us? Well, we want to know what's the story on the top. Uh, division, and what's the story on the bottom division? At 115%, what's happening there? Is it that um, there's been a huge drop-off in case filings and uh, the business of the court is drying up? Or has there been a big push locally to uh, look at old, stale filings, cases that haven't moved, summon people into court, um, possibly dismiss actions for failure to prosecute? And it's just a big cleanup effort going on there. And that's the explanation, it's a temporary explanation until it uh, reverts to uh, uh, something uh, more normal. Then at the bottom of that, you have a clearance rate of about 80%. So this is a court that's falling behind. That's a, that can be a really serious thing. It sort of depends on what the explanation is. Do they have a huge number of a new type of case because of some event, uh, many of you remember when uh, houses coated in stucco generated all kinds of litigation um, as uh, mold and other problems developed in that uh, construction. Uh, is there some other kind of case that has taken off that has uh, increased the number of filings? Or are there judicial vacancies? And the reason they're falling behind is they don't have enough judges to actually dispose of the cases as they're coming in. How do you get that addressed? Can you transfer in a judge uh, for a few months to help catch up this backlog before it really is detrimental to the public? Um, or could it be a lack of court, courtroom space? There just aren't enough courtrooms available to dispose of the business, and that's behind uh, the uh, uh, clearance rate going down. Uh, there's a different kind of resource there's a shortage of. This is the kind of information uh, that we can stay on top of easily and. Uh, make actionable because we collect the data, we can visualize it and discuss it very easily. Here's another example. 
this is just a, a chart that shows the count of uh, court events. So this is a year-over-year -year chart, uh, years uh, 2017, 18, 19, and 20 for a, a given jurisdiction. And you can see that uh, for three of those years, there's a really common pattern up and down. Sometimes it tracks the exact same weeks where there's a dip. That might be the 4th of July weekend. It might be weeks where there's a judicial conference or something like that. Um, and then you look at 2020, and you see what happens uh, in about March uh, of this year. The, uh, the court events just plummet, and that would be the pandemic uh, leading to the closure of courts and the stoppage of much court business, uh, cutting it back down to emergency matters, uh, people in custody. Uh, and that tells one kind of story. But there's so much more information in this data as well that we should be uh, uh, tracking. For example, we look at this number of events, we see it going up and down. Are there events that are being scheduled for these weeks of these dips, but they don't take place because of the judicial conference, because it's a three-day weekend, because uh, there are key personnel that are on vacation? Is that a predictable seasonal pattern that you could plan for? You can learn things like that by tracking this data and comparing it, and then compare it with how you're managing uh, your court. So, um, the ability to manage court events and visualize uh, these behavioral patterns in the system can be very, very useful. And the big lesson about data visualization is it's so much better than this slide. This is a slide of those same events that we had on a nice uh, graph on the uh, slide before. It would take a long period of study and a cup of coffee to start teasing out the lessons that could be learned from this data um, and the ability to generate a graph with uh, a few clicks of a mouse just uh, really brings this information to life. So, as Diane was saying, for data to be a strategic asset, it must be accessible, accurate, and standardized. So, let's talk about the accuracy issue. What can go wrong? Well, here's a list of things that can go wrong. You can have duplicate records or missing records, or you're relying on uh, free text fields to capture critical data that you really would like to know about, but you've relegated it to a free text field where it's hard to access. Data could be incomplete because uh, staff don't know exactly which information to capture and enter. Uh, there could be logical errors in the way data is structured, outdated information, or any other things, many other things. Um, Sometimes these data errors are one-offs. They're errors about particular records, and you can still learn valuable lessons from your system because those errors uh, don't really distort what you learn from the system. But other times, they're really systemic errors, and they can uh, lead to um, really, really misleading information, um, or in some cases, really uh, uh, tragic information, for instance, in the case of missing data. This slide, uh, just shows a few examples from the news in recent years. Um, the, uh, the top example is the church shootings in uh, Texas in 2017, where a man responsible was able to purchase guns because his criminal record had not been uh, submitted to the FBI database. Those of you who've worked on that know that the FBI requires that data to be in specific formats, and that's a data governance issue. Um, the Mother Emanuel Church shootings in South Carolina um, are another example where there was a mistake in the background database. Uh, the third example is a mistaken arrest where um, uh, two people with similar names and the same birth date um, uh, were present in the system, one of whom needed to be arrested. The other was completely innocent, but because of a data entry error, that's the person who was arrested. And then other times, the data errors uh, are just a little more entertaining, and you need to be able to look out for these, but uh, they don't mean as much. Diane shared this slide at a uh, conference a few years ago, and I was very struck by it. What it shows is the number of people at different age levels who are charged with, felon, with felonies. So over on the right, you have the 14, 15, 16-year-olds, and 17-year-olds uh, uh, charged with felonies. And you can see how that climbs. Over on the left, those little red bars, those are the felons who are under one year old and one year old and so on. 
And then if you really get into the detail in this, there are some people on this chart who are more than uh, 3,000 minus years old. So um, these are just date errors as far as birth dates. Um, and it's not that the infants are committing the felonies, it's that our data entry is wrong. And um, while I was sitting in that conference, Diane introduced this, I texted our head of research uh, in Massachusetts, she did a quick check, and sure enough, Massachusetts had a large number of infant felons as well. So that's something you can do when you get back to your office. Diane? Great. So for, for data to be a strategic asset like we've talked about, it has to be accessible. And the way we make it accessible is often through visualization. It has to be accurate. Um, because if it's not accurate, it's, it can do more, more harm than good. And finally, it, the data needs to be standardized. So the question, you know, has this ever happened in your court, for those of you who are, who are working with judges, that you provide a, a data report to a judge and the response is, your data is wrong? Well, you know, that, I can tell you that I have gotten that, gotten that response more than once and people just shut down and say, your data is wrong. Um, other times um, it had a situation where the same question led to two different responses, depending on who was pulling the data and what exactly they were looking at. And sometimes you can get different answers and that you really lose, you really lose credibility when that happens. So let's talk about some standardization and some shared assumptions. This one is timely. I took this one um, from the Rochester Regional Hospital. Um, and, and they have a, a cute little graphic on how not to wear a mask. Well, one thing that we're all being told currently is to wear a mask. And we may think we, we have an assumption about what that means to wear a mask, but clearly I can tell by walking around any, um, any store in my town that we do not have shared assumptions about what it means to wear a mask. And so there are lots of people wearing it in some really unusual or ineffective ways. Here are some of the terms that, that this, these are just a few of the examples. There are lots more of terms that we often use in the courthouse, in the courtroom, that we need to have shared assumptions about what they mean. And even more than shared assumptions, we need to have documentation about what they mean. Because when we talk about things like, I'll take a simple one from this, from this slide. When we talk about a closed case, I may have one definition in my mind of a closed case means it's been, it, it has been disposed in the courtroom. That's probably how the, the average judge would define a closed case. From the clerk's perspective, it's not a closed case until they enter the final order, enter the final paperwork and, and close it out in the, in the case management system. For the attorney, the case isn't closed perhaps until they've gotten their bill paid. There are lots of different definitions of a closed case. For us to use data effectively in the court system, we have to have a common definition of what it means to have a closed case. Um, people talk about triaging cases um, and, and treating complex cases as, differently than, as different than simple cases. Well, in order to do that triage, you have to have a shared definition of what it means to be a complex case. We saw an example of clearance rate that's documented in the court tools, but making sure that your definition is the same and it's consistent for everyone. One of my favorites is, is set for review. Different courts use, use different terminology for this, but a set for review typically means, or should mean, a case that has been disposed, but for which the court still has responsibility. So examples would be for um, child welfare cases that continue long after the initial disposition of the, of the petition, or for example, guardianship cases that require monitoring throughout the life of the guardianship. And so having, uh, in this case, I'm using set for review as an example of a case status, having clear definitions of what those terms mean. So how do you get there? How do you get good data governance? giving you some examples of ways definitely not to get to good data governments. A path to failed data governments is just to say it's IT's job and it's not something I have to worry about. 
Um, the path to successful data governance is understanding that everybody has to participate, that, that everybody needs good data, um, and they know that they need good data. They place value on using good data. Um, and that way they also have, they also have buy-in to the data governance. A path to failed data governance is, is for a judge to say, all I need to care about is the person standing in front of me. And I'll tell you, a few years ago, I was giving a talk to a, to a group of judges, and I had talked to this group of judges before, and we had talked about data governance over the course of several years. And um, a judge in a meeting said, I'm not worried about this stuff. I'm not worried about your reports. I'm not worried about those monthly reports. All I need to care about is the person standing in front of me. That's my job. And before I could even draw a breath to think about how to respond to that in this setting, the other judges all turned on that judge and said, it is absolutely our job to worry about that. It's our job to worry about who's not in front of us and why they're not in front of us. It's our job to worry about whether there's a backlog forming. It's our job to be concerned about the entire flow of cases through the system. Um, and so that, that's a path to successful data governance when you have that kind of understanding among the court personnel. You often hear people say, I don't have time to worry about data governance. And you know, I understand that. Things aren't on fire. It's hard to pay attention. And this year, there's been a lot of stuff on fire. So it is, it's been hard to take time to, to think about data governance. But you waste an enormous amount of time if you're not doing good data governance. Trying to chase down correct information if it wasn't entered on the front end is incredibly difficult. Trying to rebuild credibility after you've given a bad report is incredibly difficult. Um, it is, if you understand the value and the way that it makes all other aspects of your court operate more smoothly, is what helps you to take time to do that data governance. So regardless of where you were on the question I asked earlier, whether you're asking what exactly is data governance or you're already pretty far along your plan, Thinking about, um, thinking about your data governance strategy and starting with your data governance committee. We've given a few examples here of the kind of people who should be on your, um, on your data governance committee. And I'm gonna turn this over to John. Thanks, Diane. Um, I gotta tell you, uh, in all honesty, in, in Massachusetts, we're not there yet, but we are, we are on our way. We have a sort of proto Data Governance Committee, and it's a committee that we formed in responding to compiled data requests. So these are the external requests that we get from other government agencies, from the press, uh, from uh, academics, and they're asking us to pull together data. And we have um, a standing committee with a composition almost exactly like this, because when we know this data is going out the door and will be scrutinized by people outside, we do get very serious about making sure that it's a correct an accurate representation of things happening in our court system. Um, we are fortunate to have an excellent uh, research and planning office um, to uh, support this. And from time to time, we form ad hoc committees to address particular data governance issues. That may be uh, related to the implementation of a particular uh, uh, IT solution. It may be for some other purpose, but those are committees that come and go. We need to move toward an, uh, uh, a, a more comprehensive data governance approach. And of course, 2020 was the year of data quality until it became the year of COVID. Um, so uh, we have not made the progress on this we expected, um, but we have found the value in the committees that we do have and having all of these stakeholders in place to do it. We just need to turn the same scrutiny on our internal processes. Uh, that we turn on releasing data uh, externally. Diane? So let's think about the job descriptions that we have in, in, um, in, a, in a data governance framework. One, one role that you need to have in responsibility, not in title, is a chief data officer. Some organizations actually have a person whose job title is chief data officer or CDO. Um, but many others don't have that as a job title, but have it as, as part of, of someone's job responsibility and job description. So the chief data officer is the person who has ultimate responsibility for making sure that the data governance plan is in place, that it is a, a process, as I mentioned earlier, 
continuous learning, continuous improvement, um, bringing together the stakeholders, convening the meetings, um, keeping up with the descriptions, making sure they're available. That is all under the purview of the Chief Data Officer. Other individuals who, um, again, this may not be a job title anyone has, but they're very important roles in the organization, um, include the data stewards. A data steward is someone who is really the expert on a particular type of data or maybe the data from a particular court. So they are the go-to person. Um, they, they are the ones who um, make sure that the data entry is, is consistent with the data definitions. Um, that the data are um, um, that the data are usable. They are often the ones who are um, producing data reports from specific data. So, just to give one example, um, juvenile data is often um, a bit more complex than than data, for example, from a civil case or or a domestic case, possibly. Um, so, the the juvenile data steward would be the person who really knows that juvenile data inside and out. Um, knows where it's reliable, knows where there are knows where there are issues, and maintains the definitions of the data. Another very important rule is the public access manager. Different courts, different states, different jurisdictions have different rules about who can access court data. Now that so much of our data is electronic, um, many many states uh, jurisdictions have have data that's available on the web um, to anybody who looks, you really have to pay attention to make sure that things that should not be public are not public. And so having somebody who's responsible for that. The public access manager will typically also be the one who responds to data requests. And most courts around the country are seeing the number of data requests absolutely skyrocket. And so having someone with that responsibility is important. And finally, data quality analysts. Who's making sure that the data that are entered are accurate, um, making sure that they say what we need them to say, making sure that you don't have infant felons in your state um, or other, other very, you know, very obvious or sometimes not so obvious data errors um, and making sure that they're good. And again, most courts are not going to have individuals who have these job descriptions exactly, but they should be part of people's jobs um, in, the, in the court system. So when we're thinking about data governance, we really want to think about the entire life cycle of data. And this starts with identifying the data that you need in your court system. Being interested in something is not reason enough to collect it. If you do not have a plan for using the data, you need to think very hard about whether it is the right thing to do to collect it or not. Um, the data that needed data, um, you, you want to think, first of all, about what courts need to be able to manage their cases. But you also need to think about what does the court need to plan, to budget, to evaluate, um, all of the things that you are doing as part of, part of your court performance assessment. So thinking about that needed data. I want to take a moment and talk about the... Um, to talk about race and ethnicity data because this has been a very um, this has been a big topic with with everything that is happening um, a lot of courts are paying a lot of attention to questions of race and ethnicity and thinking about how their courts operate um, so again this is really important in the identifying needed data if you're not collecting race and ethnicity data asking whether you should be collecting it and how you're going to use it. You always want to make sure that you've got a plan for it, how you're going to use it, what might you change, or what do you want to learn as a result of, of, as a result of knowing that data. So that first step is, is identifying needed data. I'll make a quick plug here too on the court statistics website. We do have a special topics piece on collecting race and ethnicity data because we've had, we've had so many questions about that over the, over the past couple of months. The next step is data collection. So your data governance policy should address who knows when you're collecting a piece of when you're collecting a piece of data, who knows it? How is it collected? How does it get into your case management system? So thinking through those stages, 
in some jurisdictions, when cases are filed, they use a, a cover sheet, an old-fashioned piece of paper where they write down or type in, um, usually a fillable form, um, the critical information about that case that the court can use to get that information into the case management system. Many courts, and especially now, have gone much more strongly into e-filing. So that's a big area of data collection is how, um, is how the e-filing system works and how data are entered and what kinds of checks you have on the accuracy of that data. Um, sometimes data collection comes from, from other agencies. So your jurisdiction may have a data exchange with, um, with law enforcement, for example, to, to be able to get uh, traffic tickets into that they come directly into your system. There may be um, there may be data exchange with your driver's license database, uh, uh, with your child welfare agency. There are lots of examples where data may be coming in from other agencies. Paying attention to, to regardless of how the data is collected, paying attention to that data quality is really important. And your data governance policy should address um, what to do with data coming in from another agency if it's known to be poor quality or they're known to be problems. So thinking about what data you need thinking about how you collect it, how that data is collected. Again, I can't emphasize enough that it has to be consistent with your business processes. Data collection cannot be a separate side activity. It has to be a really central part of how the court operates. The next is data storage. And this is often more of an IT question, but thinking about where data is stored um, yeah, in terms of at, at what time, how accessible is it, um, when is it archived? Um, thinking about thinking about those questions of, of data storage and, and access, which leads us right into the next, which is data use. So who are the users of your data? Can they get the data they need when they need it in the amount that they need it that's not overwhelming, that's usable for them? So in thinking about data use, we're thinking about the internal users of data, for example, the judges and court administrators and other staff in the courthouse getting the data that they need, but also thinking about our external users of data um, and how they have access, whether it's through your public portal, whether it's through data requests, or whether you have a, a sort of self-service um, data, data website people can use to pull, to pull aggregate data or, um, or uh, data that's allowed to be shared publicly. And finally, and this is one where, where we often drop the ball, um, and that's data deletion. When data is at the end of its life, first of all, your data governance policy should define what the end of life is, and that has to be consistent with your, with your state law and with your court rules. Um, but when data reaches the end of its life, um, what do you do with that data? We could have a whole talk on data deletion, especially from case management systems, because it can be quite complicated. I will just tell you that, you're, that in thinking about this, your data governance policy should really address whether data deletion means a hard data deletion in which that, that information is completely gone, never accessible to anyone again, or is it a soft deletion by which perhaps it's de-identified, but the basic facts uh, still remain. And so there are some pros and cons both ways. Completely deleting a case, it, it's gone forever. There's no, there's no question about that. It does, doing a soft deletion where you remove any identifiable information, uh, but keep, for example, the, the file date and the case type, allows you to do some historical looks at what's happened in your court in terms of, in terms of looking at trends. It is also sometimes the more practical option, uh, particularly when you have case management systems with, with complicated um, schemas where getting rid of one thing has lots of implications for other parts. And so that's why it's so important to have IT at the table when you're, when you're talking about data governance. So this is a very, quick, a very quick trip around thinking about the life cycle of data, but I wanna encourage you to be thinking about data, again, from even from thinking about what you need all the way through to when, when that data uh, should be deleted one way or another. John, do you want to talk a little bit about data quality? Certainly. So um, data quality has to be a part of everyone's job in the court system. And um, in your communications with your workforce, you really need to uh, make sure to include this um, and elevate it 
um, in your communications. We need to all appreciate those members of the clerk's office, those judges uh, and others who work with data every day and are especially responsible for inputting data and capturing data. For those who are incredibly conscientious and want to get the best data in place. Um, we need to recognize and celebrate those people, but we also need to properly train our workforce. And this gets into our HR processes. Uh, the more that we've moved in Massachusetts to online training, we've recognized that this is a great opportunity to improve data quality because historically, a lot of the people doing this work uh, perform this work being trained by a supervisor or someone whose job they were taking. And this led to lots and lots of local variations in understanding of what data was important, particular definitions, uh, and what people's obligations were to capture data. And it's not until you begin to aggregate data from different locations that you realize that you have a real definition drift um, because staff at different places understand uh, terminology to mean different things. It may be, we use this word for this kind of a disp disposition in this uh, court, but um, a few miles away, another court uses a different term for the exact same type of disposition. And it's not to say that either one of them is wrong in and of itself, but it's a huge problem in data governance if you don't reconcile those differences and settle on uh, one variety. So training of uh, your staff, people part, um, is huge. Getting there uh, has to do a lot with processes. Your uh, definitions of uh, terms, for example, need to be standardized and published and have a data dictionary. We need to come up with a way to audit and report to data quality issues. Typically, we find those uh, most often because of a press inquiry. The press asks about some feature of the system. We haven't looked at it in a long time. We start pulling the data and then we discover we have uh, a wide divergence in the use of terminology. Um, fortunately, there's usually kind of a majority view and a minority view. And so most courts are using it in one way and we only have to clean up uh, the other courts, but we shouldn't find ourselves in that situation going forward. We should have standard definitions that are readily accessible to everyone. We should have good processes uh, to monitor and review those terms uh, to make sure that uh, we're generating consistent data. Technology can be a big um, uh, uh, source of, of help in this area. Uh, you can validate data by looking at uh, uh, variations in usage. If uh, one court uses a certain term uh, far more frequently than another court, that may be an indication that uh, there are different definitions being used in different places. Um, exception reports, when things are not uh, categorized in a standard uh, way and you get a report of that, if you dig into it, you may find that it was not an exceptional case. It was that the person responsible for categorizing the case didn't understand the right categories. Um, electronic filing is a great thing in that it uh, reduces repetitive data entry um, and allows us to stabilize uh, usages and, and points us at uh, particular um, uh, fields. And then again, data visualization. If you look at the distribution of use of certain terms uh, or other approaches using data visualization, it helps you identify the outliers. And finally, the, the data um, information uh, itself. As I mentioned, uh, data definitions and having a data dictionary um, is important. And poor quality source data, um, uh, whether that's information that's being imported from other databases, um, or poor practices uh, that you've identified, you need to go back to that source and uh, start trying to clean up that source data so that you'll have good, useful quality afterwards. Uh, there's a huge national initiative going on that will help drive these conversations nationwide. Uh, Diane, would you like to talk about NODS? Sure, I'll be happy to. NOD stands for National Open Court Data Standards, um, and it's an initiative that's been taken on by the National Center for State Courts and was actually just published earlier, earlier this year. So what are standards? Standards are the rules by which data are described and reported. So giving some common standards to use nationwide. And the scope included in NODs are the data maintained by courts for business purposes. It does not include every data item that might be collected by a court it may not include every data item that your court needs, but
but it's looking at the data that are maintained by courts for business purposes, this should have an and, and is commonly requested by external users. You know, one of the challenges that we have, when, particularly when we have people who don't work in the court system, um, but who want to use court data, is that they assume that, that one term means the same thing across multiple courts. So earlier I gave the example of having different definitions of what a closed case means. I have seen reports where that has led to really, really misleading reports and uh, incorrect interpretation of court data because the person who was using the data did not realize that those terms were used differently in different jurisdictions. So to give one example, they may say that this, you know, this state courts close um, you know, on average three months earlier than in the neighboring state. Well, that may or may not be true depending on the definitions that were being used. So the idea of nods is to have court data standards that everyone can map to um, that will then allow external users to use um, to use data more appropriately. Doesn't guarantee that there won't ever be those misinterpretations or, or uh, misleading misleading reports, but we're trying to minimize that. And I realize I'm saying external court users. This is true for internal users also, because we all tend to assume that the way that we use language in our own courts is the way that everybody else uses it. Um, but we know that that's not true. And sometimes even neighboring courthouses use the same term differently. So these are very helpful for being able to map your data to some common standards. It doesn't require you to change your case management system. Again, it's a mapping exercise to get to align your, the, the terms in your case management system to the national standards. I wanna be really clear that these are voluntary, so it's not a requirement that any court participate or map their data to nods. It, it's meant as a tool, but it, but it is absolutely voluntary. It's aspirational. There are data elements in nods that very, very few courts um, collect or have, in a, have um, in a state that is shareable, but it is aspirational in that front uh, for, for what it would be useful if courts did. And they're separable. So if you decided, for example, that we want to map our criminal data to nods, but we're not gonna worry about civil yet, you can absolutely do that. So there are a number of different um, parts of, of, the nods, um, of the nods project. The, the most central one is the, the data element spreadsheet. And I included just a, a tiny little clip of this. It's a, it is, it's a very large document. If you open it up, you'll notice that it has multiple tabs. The tabs in this worksheet are all based on different types of data. So for example, there's a tab about case information, there's a tab about case participants, there's a tab about sanctions that would apply to criminal cases and some delinquency cases. There are um, tabs that are specific to guardianship information, which is quite specific and different from other case types. Um, so that you'll see that there are multiple tabs. Within each tab, there you will see that the, date, the named data element, so let's take the first one on this page is court case identifier. It gives a definition for what that is, and then it gives what the values, what you can map the values to. So to go down to the primary case category, the definition is the subject area of the case, and then the values that you would map that to would be civil, criminal, domestic, juvenile, dependency, probate, and traffic. Um, regardless of what you call them in your own case management system, to be consistent with NODS, this is what you would map them to for, for releasing data. On the left-hand side of, of this spreadsheet, it, you can see the case types across the top. So civil, family, probate, dependency, juvenile, criminal, and traffic. And an X indicates that this case, um, this data element is relevant to that, um, to that subject area. So court case identifier, state, court, and primary case category, that's gonna apply across the board. But within civil case category, um, the team of experts that, that uh, defined this um, it broke it further down into tort, contract, real property, small claims, and other civil. That obviously only applies to civil, so you can see that the X there is, is under, under the civil column only. So this is a great resource, especially for courts that, that um, perhaps don't have uh, written data definitions yet. This is a good, a good place to start and a good resource. 
if you do already have those, then it, then, um, it provides that guidance for, for mapping. The second, uh, the second part of the, of the NODS resources is a leadership guide. This is a pretty high level overview of NODS about what it is, how, how NODS was developed, how it's useful for courts, and this is intended for the leadership. So this is intended for the court administrators or for judges who want a pretty high level understanding of what NODS is about. We also have a user guide for NODS. The user guide takes the data elements in the spreadsheet and provides some additional context, some additional information, some tips. Um, we also provide information on mapping data elements between NODS. And for those of you who are familiar with the Court Statistics Project um, with the CSP definitions. So it, it provides some additional information and context I will tell you that the user guide is very much of a work in progress because as more courts start using NODS, um, they're asking really excellent questions. And some of those are things that we are then going back and, and updating the user guide to address things that are, that are common questions. And the final piece of the NODS resources are the technical models. And I will beg you, not to ask me any questions about the relationship model because I will need to turn those over to my friends in IT. But they have provided information for your IT department about uh, the relationship models between the elements in NODS. And so for, for courts that are looking at their case management systems, you know, I mentioned that, that our vision of NODS is that, is that courts will be mapping their data elements. This is helpful in being able to do that but also as you make revisions or develop new case management systems, this may be a helpful resource for you to use for that as well. I will tell you that the, you know, the larger case, uh, case management system vendors are aware of NODS um, and I expect we'll be, we'll be taking, taking that into, a, into account going forward. So this is another piece of the, the technical dictionary um, that would be used by, by IT in actually doing NODS implementation performance. Let's talk about what, what your next steps might be. We have a number of resources um, that will be helpful to you. One is the data governance guide, and I've given you a link uh, directly to the data governance uh, policy guide. Um, you can also get to it just by going to courtstatistics.org. Um, and that is where um, much of the information that we have covered today is covered in, in greater depth, in greater detail um, in the Data Governance Policy Guide. We also have there a number of documents that have been created by other courts that you can use for reference. It's always nice to see what other people have done and what other people have thought through. And so we have links to a number of documents. I'll also say, if you have data governance documents excuse me, data governance documents that you are proud of and that you would like to share, we would love to have those. And so please feel free to send those and we'll be, we would love to be able to link even more resources for use by different courts. We've talked about NODS. Um, NODS is available again from the National Center website. It's www.ncse.org slash NODS. Um, and that's where you can get the, the, the spreadsheet the leadership guide, the user guide, and also links links to the to the technical guide, and those are those are documents that uh, that should be should be helpful to you. So with that, thank you. That is the end of our the end of our session. And normally at this time, we would be we would be happy to take questions. Um, I believe that we'll have an ability if you submit those questions through the through the chat function. Um, that we will be able to take and address those questions um, and and get back to you after after the presentation. That's right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.